Good afternoon from beautiful Perryville, Kentucky. I'm Rich Gimbert, the Civil War Traveler, and I'm at beautiful Perryville State Historic Site, and I have the honor today of talking with Mr. Chuck Lott, vocational historian, and Mr. John Belisle, interpretive historian. Gentlemen, thank you for your time today. You're very welcome. Glad and, to have you. Uh, your battlefield here is absolutely beautiful, and you told me you've taken a lot of pride in keeping it authentic to the day. Uh, to, 1862. Chuck, can you tell me a little bit about those? Uh, yeah, well, uh, a lot of the grounds, uh, our, one of our goals uh, as part of the, uh, the Friends of Perryville Battlefield Historic Site, one of our goals is to return the grounds here to the, the state they were in the year of the battle. In other words, if we were to bring uh, a soldier back today to look at this grounds. We want him to say, I know this place, it's Perryville. Uh, toward that end, we, we have very few monuments. In, in, instead, we direct our energies towards recreating the original farmstead that the soldiers saw and, and fought over in 1862. So uh, that includes trying to build uh, rail fences on the foot that footprint that they existed on at the time. Ultimately, we want to replace the crops in within those defined uh, fields. Uh, presently, uh, not having that much seed money, <laughs> we, we've uh, instead put 700 acres of our 1,100 into native species wildflowers uh, in order to stimulate uh, the natural pollinator population and, and help out the wildlife in the area, such as quail, rabbit. Right, and on that subject, the wildflowers are absolutely beautiful here on property. Um, I find as I get older, I appreciate the more natural beauty that each battlefield has to offer, and I have to say that Perryville here has absolutely stunning natural beauty, and that your efforts are very much on display here. It's quite frankly awesome. Thank you. Uh, like I said, when you talk about the landscape, and we talk about revegetating, you know, into wildflowers and native species, uh, we still leave uh, the woodlots where, where they were described in the day. The open ground or the, the wildflowers uh, in the day would have been crop fields of, of corn or wheat, but otherwise open ground versus wooded ground is essentially the same fuchsia that you would have had 150 years ago. So, so vocational historian, that means you might know a thing or two about the Perryville Battle. Uh, a few things. <laughs> okay, so let's just talk about a couple of very unique uh, things that uh, you were able to talk to me about earlier today. Let's first talk about uh, the use of the Henry Rifle here at the Battle of Perryville. Well, uh, the Henry Rifle w was introduced uh, in the early 1860s, uh, it hit the commercial market uh, again uh, midsummer, I think, early spring of 1862. Uh, and actually, what's unique about that is that we've recovered two trails of Henry rifle shell casings uh, that follow the flanks of the position where we, we ascribe to the first Wisconsin infantry. Uh, that said, the 1st Wisconsin Infantry happened to pass from Nashville through Louisville where they drew back pay just in time to find one of the merchants in Louisville was advertising the brand new Henry rifle. And voila, they're dropping shell casings here at the Perryville Battlefield as they are engaged. So a Henry rifle is a lever action rifle we ascribe uh, to Winchester repeating arms as their first re real repeating arm, and it carried a magazine tube full of 15 to 17 rounds, right? It was, Correct. Uh, it was that damn Yankee rifle you could load on Sunday and shoot all week, right? Correct. Uh, even though it's a, it was a relatively low-powered cartridge it was relative to the standard infantry rifle, but its rate of fire made it a, a very effective defensive weapon. So. And the unique thing, again, as I had mentioned earlier, was that the first Wisconsin veterans employed that heavy volume of fire to secure their flanks of their lines. So, That's to me, true. that is intriguing. It is intriguing, and it's something very unique to the Perryville battlefield. 
Also, uh, tell me about uh, acoustic shadowing. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Uh, yeah, uh, an acoustic shadow is, is a phenomenon caused by the a combination of wind and terrain, where the terrain, as it undulates, uh, acts like an egg crate, and the wind passing over it will actually carry sound downwind, but mute it if you're upwind. So, and so the boss of uh, the Federal Army, General Don Carlos Buell, has his headquarters three miles southwest of here, uh, which is directly upwind of the battlefield, uh, which means he hears the sounds, he states later on, of intermittent cannon fire during the five-hour battle that rages three miles away. Forty-five miles to the northeast, Edmund Garant uh, in Frankfort, Kentucky, clearly hears the sound of a battle and knows the fight for Kentucky has begun. In his diary, he states that. So it's just that phenomena that uh, it, it's a very real thing. You can actually come out here on a reenactment and experience it if the wind is working with mm -hmm. you, you know. But, but it's just a unique thing. It prevents uh, the Union Army from fully uh, utilizing the forces at their disposal. Okay, okay. Now, uh, Mr. Blois, you're, uh, you're obviously dressed a little warm for today. Uh, can you tell me how you're dressed, sir? Well, uh, we had the standard issue uh, First Tennessee uniform right here. Uh, you'd have the OVM belt buckle and the OVM cartridge box, and it would have the state seal here. That is uh, Ohio Volunteer Militia. So we would have stole this from a Union corpse as well as the uh, the pants here, these are federal blue, so we would have either uh, stole those from a corpse or from a depot that we had raided. Uh, the boots here would have been standard issue for both sides. This is a brogan. Uh, they could either be wooden sold or leather sold. Uh, as the war progressed, Confederate uh, supplies would have dwindled, so they would have used wooden soles on these. Uh, and the reason why you would see a lot of Confederate uh, scavenging is because the Confederate government would not supply its troops after so long of a time. So that's why we would steal these because our old gear would wear out. Um, then you have bayonet here. The bayonet would be a standard issue for all troops, but uh, as you can see, this is a Spring Springfield flintlock. So this is a Union gun and uh, we would have uh, probably stole this from the battlefield as well, as well as its cartridges that it would have had. This is a 69 caliber uh, smoothbore musket, and the bayonet would have went with the gun. So uh, the slouch hat here is not standard issue. This would have been my civilian hat. I wouldn't have really liked the government issue uh, kepi that, that I would have been given, so I would have probably either traded that or sold it to someone else. I would have just kept my hat that I had came in. War. So the Confederate forces really practice the old military axiom, gear adrift is a geared gift. Right. They, they done that very strictly. Okay, and can you tell us about the Confederate monument here um, at the uh, Perryville battle site? Yes, uh, we are standing on a mass grave. It is composed of two trenches, composing of a hundred men per trench. All Confederate fallen here, all killed in action. They would have had uh, a detail, a burial detail, from residents of Perryville, Bottom, and his daughter, as well as some of his kinfolk. They would have came here, they would have dragged the bodies from around the field and would have brought them here. Uh, this is the only grave site we have here at Perryville that we know of. There are a lot of uh, unknown graves uh, to this day, uh, but we do have 200 men buried in two trenches on either side of the monument here. Uh, and the monument was actually put up in the early 1900s. Uh, so, and the rock fence that you see all the way around here, that was built by Bottom as well, later on, uh, after he had buried these men here. And uh, last thing, uh, Chuck, can you uh, tell us uh, the importance, the strategic importance real quickly of Kentucky and uh, Abraham Lincoln's thoughts on the importance of Kentucky? Well, uh, sure, I'll try to address that. I'll 
try to not get, try to not get too long-winded for you. <laughs> Essentially, uh, Kentucky was a, a border state. Uh, it was a very populous state at the time. It enjoyed in 1860 probably the the ninth highest gross annual product of all the 34 states. So it was a very wealthy, populous, and politically powerful state. It had just provided our country with a vice president, John C. Breckinridge, who would go Confederate, but still, Kentucky does go into the war as a very desirable entity in terms of its population and its, its productivity, the resources it can offer in beef and hemp and, and corn, as well as being strategically placed for the Union forces to invade the South. The South also desired Kentucky because having access to those same resources and having the Ohio River as a natural northern border, which would be easily defensible against the North, you know, it was a, a, a strategic pull for both sides. Furthermore, it happened to be the birthplace of both Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis, so you have a little, uh, a a lot of of, you have a little political interest on, on the, the upper ends of the government on both sides as well. But mostly, it's strategically located, pull uh, Kentucky into the fold, probably Missouri will follow, and possibly even the other two border states. So it's, it's a real uh, draw for, for the Confederacy to come up here and try to embolden the citizens of the state to cast off that yoke of federal occupation and join with them. So well, that did doesn't come to pass. But Abraham Lincoln once said, I would like God on our side, but I need Kentucky. But I must have Kentucky. Right, that's right, right, he did. Right. So that's how so, important uh, President Lincoln viewed Kentucky to the entire federal war. Right. After. Because he, he did fear that if Kentucky went southern, that he would lose the other border states as well. And John, um, you seem to be cued into the reenacting community here, possibly by the way you're dressed. Is there a major reenactment that occurs here? Yes, we will have a reenactment every first weekend of October. Uh, this year it will be on the 6th and the 7th, and uh, it happens every year. All right. Every four or five years that reenactment will be a larger affair. Uh, in 2016 we, we had a reenactment here with around 3,000 reenactors present. So we can do a fairly large scale event and depict brigade versus brigade or Excellent. at some scale. <laughs> Gentlemen, but. I'd like to thank you for your time and really this has truly been a gem and folks out there, what I would recommend is you come, you bring your lunch, you spend the day and you hike the trails. It's absolutely beautiful here in midsummer. I can imagine it will only be more beautiful in the fall. All right, Rich Gimbert, the Civil War Traveler here, and I'll see you on the trail. Thank you all very much. We hope to see you all too. <laughs>